All right, good morning, everybody. I thought we might have church outside. Uh, Memorial Garden, nice day. No, we can do it in here. I invite you to stand for the rite of confession and forgiveness. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Trust in God's promise of forgiveness, let us confess our sin. O merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart and soul and mind and strength. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. In your mercy, forgive what we have been, help us to remend what we are, and direct what we shall be, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen. Hear the good news. Christ died for us. Christ rose for us. Christ reigns for us. And Christ prays for us. Anyone who is in Christ is a new creation. The old life has gone and a new life has begun. And in Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. Thanks be to God. Amen. of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all.
Let us pray. Compassionate God, you gather the whole universe into your radiant presence and continually reveal your Son as our Savior. Bring wholeness to all that is broken and speak truth to us in our confusion that all creation will see and know your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Okay, so we're doing, we're continuing in the small catechism. We'll finish by the end of this year, I think. I think. Uh, so this is, we're in the Lord's Prayer right now. We're talking about forgiveness. This is what Luther says. It says, forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. What does this mean? We ask in this prayer that our Heavenly Father would not regard our sins nor deny these petitions on their account, for we're worthy of nothing for which we ask, nor have we earned it. Instead, we ask that God would give us all things by grace, for we daily sin much and indeed deserve only punishment. So, on the other hand, we too truly want to forgive heartily and to do good gladly to those who sin against us. So sometimes people in the Lord's Prayer, they get caught up on the sins, trespasses thing. That's not the important thing. The important thing is the way the New Testament talks about forgiveness. I'm going to give you a tangible way to think about it. Does anybody know what this is called? A cincture, good job. Some, some people like to wear these. Um, this is, it's something you wear around an alb, and you put it like this, and then what do you have to do after you wrap it around you? Yeah, you gotta, yeah, you gotta tie a knot, right? We use knots to hold things in place. It could be a cincture, if you go fishing, you gotta tie a knot, right? When you tie a knot, you say you're binding something to where it is. The New Testament uses this image to talk about forgiveness. And it says, like, imagine that someone wronged you, right? Like, let's say, I don't know, Bill Joseph cut me off in, in traffic. I'm, I'm going to take that experience and I'm going to bind that to Bill Joseph. And I'm going to say, no matter what else he does, I always remember that thing that Bill Joseph did to me. The New Testament, when it talks about forgiveness, when it says forgive, the word it uses is luo. Luo means loosen. It means untying something. So the image of forgiveness here is that whenever we bind something to someone else, that we actually unbind it. And we'll talk about this in the gospel reading, but we create new possibilities when we do that for people. So that's what we're talking about when we talk about forgiveness. That's it. Okay. The first reading is from Deuteronomy chapter 18. Moses said, The Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from among your own people. You said, shall heed such a prophet. This is what you requested of the Lord your God at Horeb on the day of the assembly when you said, If I hear the voice of the Lord my God anymore, or ever again see this great fire, I will die. Then the Lord replied to me, They are right in what they have said. I will raise up for them a prophet like you from among their own people. I will put my words in the mouth of the prophet, who shall speak to them everything that I command. Anyone who does not heed the words that the prophet shall speak in my name, I myself will hold accountable. But any prophet who speaks in the name of other gods, or who presumes to speak in my name a word that I have not commanded the prophet to speak, that prophet shall die. The word of the Lord. You give food to those who fear you, remembering forever your covenant. You have shown your power, the power of your works, in giving them the lands of the nations. The works of your hands are faithfulness and justice. All of your precepts are sure. They stand fast forever and ever 
because they are done in truth and equity. You sent redemption to your people and commanded your covenant forever. Holy and awesome is your name. The second reading is from 1 Corinthians chapter 8. Now concerning food sacrificed to idols, we know that all of us possess knowledge. Knowledge puffs up, but love builds up. Anyone who claims to know something does not yet have the necessary knowledge, but anyone who loves God is known by him. Hence, as to the eating of food offered to idols, we know that no idol in the world really exists and that there is no God but one. Indeed, even though there may be so-called gods in heaven or on earth, as in fact there are many gods and many lords, yet for us there is one God, the Father, from whom all things and for whom we exist, and one Lord, Jesus Christ, through whom we are all things and through whom we exist. The word of the Lord. It is not everyone, however, who has this knowledge. Since some have become so accustomed to idols until now, they still think of the food they eat as food offered to an idol, and their conscience, being weak, is defiled. Food will not bring us close to God. We are no worse off if we do not eat and no better off if we do. But take care that this liberty of yours does not somehow become a stumbling block to the weak. For if others see you who possess knowledge, eating in the temple of an idol, might they not, since their conscience is weak, be encouraged to the point of eating food sacrificed to idols? So by your knowledge, those weak believers for whom Christ died are destroyed. But when you thus sin against members of your family and wound their conscience when it is weak, you sin against Christ. Therefore, if food is a cause of their failing, I will never eat meat so that I may not cause one of them to fall. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. This is the Holy Gospel according to St. Mark. Glory to you, O Lord. Jesus and his disciples went into Capernaum, and when the Sabbath came, he entered the synagogue and taught. They were astounded at his teaching, for he taught them as one having authority and not as the scribes. Just then there was in their synagogue a man with an unclean spirit, and he cried out, What have you to do with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. But Jesus rebuked him, saying, Be silent and come out of him. And the unclean spirit, convulsing him and crying out with a loud voice, came out of him. They were all amazed, and they kept on asking one another, What is this? A new teaching with authority. He commands even the unclean spirits, and they obey him. At once, Jesus' fame began to spread throughout the surrounding region of Galilee. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. The poet Anne Bradstreet once wrote that authority without wisdom is like a heavy axe without an edge fitter to bruise than polish. St. Mark probably would have agreed with that. In today's reading from Mark's Gospel, Jesus continues his public ministry. So far, he's proclaimed that the kingdom of God has come near, invited people to believe the good news, and called his first disciples. And now you can see Mark turn to a question everybody must have been wondering. Who is this guy exactly? Or to be more precise, by what authority is he doing any of this stuff? You could imagine Mark's Jesus responding with the heavy axe approach. Get louder, get combative, just barrel people over into submission. 
but instead marks Jesus' builds authority with wisdom. Not by trying to wear people down so they give up, but by coming alongside people where they are and inviting them to pay attention and trust what he's doing. In today's Gospel reading, we heard two different stories back-to-back about the way that Jesus does that. The first one is as part of the service in the synagogue, Jesus reads a portion of Scripture and offers a commentary on it. This is normal. If you went to a synagogue when Jesus was alive, typically someone gets up, they read a portion of Scripture, and then they talk about what it means. The people who do that are usually the scribes. The scribes, they're like the most bookish people you've ever met. They've read everything. And so they get up, and what do they do? They start quoting other people. They say, well, Rabbi so-and-so said this, Rabbi so-and-so said this, you know, Rabbi so-and-so said that. It would be like, imagine if I got up on Sunday, and I was like, well, you know, there's a good Pope Francis homily about today's reading, and he's the Pope, so it's probably better than what I got. So I'm just going to read you what the Pope says about it. But when Jesus gets up, Jesus actually teaches. To use the words from today's Deuteronomy reading, Jesus teaches the word of God. He actually has the authority and the wisdom within himself. So Mark is trying to tell us Jesus is someone who teaches us the word of God with authority. But Mark wants to make it clear Jesus isn't just someone who's a good speaker. And so he tells us a story about a man with an unclean spirit who just so happens to be in the room. Mark writes, just then there was in the synagogue a man with an unclean spirit, and he cried out, what have you to do with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. So to make this story useful to us, we have to remember Mark lives in a time pre-science, right? Things we take for granted, germs, hand-washing, vaccines, DNA. Mark does not have any of this. And so in Mark's world, when they see someone who's sick, instead of saying, well, they have a virus or something, they would have said some unclean spirit, some malevolent thing has got a hold of them. Now, this is the kind of thing that, to be honest, I read this and I just sort of roll my eyes at it. And I think, I really wish this wasn't in the gospel. But I think there's something here that us moderns have held on to. If you think about the way we talk about other afflictions, especially addiction and mental health, you often see this kind of language. We might say that someone who has an addiction, that their addiction has a hold on them, or that depression has someone in its grip, or that someone who's going through a bad time is fighting some demons right now. These are obviously metaphors. These are not literal ways of talking about the world. But they offer us some way of thinking about the man in today's story. We don't know much about this person, but we know at least two things. One is his life has been taken over by something that's larger than himself. That this is not someone who has a head cold. This is someone whose life has been turned inside out by this affliction. The second is that he can't fix it himself. He needs someone from outside to help him out of this predicament. And that's exactly what Jesus does. Mark says, Jesus rebuked the spirit saying, be silent and come out of him. Jesus liberates this man from what possesses him. He frees him and restores him back to newness of life. So the point Mark is making with those two stories isn't just that Jesus is a good teacher. Lots of people are good teachers. Isn't just that Jesus can heal people. Lots of people heal people. It's that Jesus is someone who uses his power to create wholeness, flourishing, and peace. Jesus has our interests at heart, and he combines his authority with wisdom. And what's so remarkable, what's different about the authority that Jesus has is he doesn't just keep it to himself. Usually we think of authority as a zero-sum game. If I give you authority, then I have less authority than I used to have. What's the word we use for people who want to hoard power? They're authoritarian. They want all the authority for themselves. But Jesus, in Mark 6, takes this authority and gives gives it away to the disciples. He says, I'm giving you the authority over the unclean spirits. So what I do, now you go here. You go heal, you go teach, you go proclaim that the kingdom of God has come near. Now some of you know, our liturgy, if you do it by the book, which occasionally we do it by the book, there's one time when I use Jesus' authority explicitly, where I say, I'm the pastor, my authority, this is how I'm using it. It's not before the gospel, not before communion, not before the offering. 
It's in the declaration of forgiveness. If you do the entire thing, it's in the mercy of Almighty God, Jesus Christ was given to die for us. And for his sake, God forgives us all of our sins. As a called and ordained minister of the Church of Christ, and by his authority, I therefore declare to you the entire forgiveness of all your sins. When I use my authority, I don't do it to get you to do something for me. I do it to offer you new life. And that's the same for all of us, not just for clergy. The authority that Jesus gives us is not the authority to coerce other people into doing things. It's the authority to offer new life to other people. Jesus gives us the authority to stand up for the marginalized, to feed the hungry, to care for creation, accompany the lonely, and care for the ill. And even better, Jesus gives us the wisdom to be sensitive, caring, and humble as we do it. Authority without wisdom is a blunt ax. Wisdom without authority is just consulting. But when the Holy Spirit brings those two together in our service, the authority of Jesus and the wisdom of Christ, the kingdom of God always comes near. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.
Let's join together with the church around the world as we confess our faith using the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again, he ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. I invite the assembly to sit or kneel for the reading of today's prayers. As we celebrate Christ embodied in human form, we pray for God's blessing on the church, the world, and all of creation. Loving God, we pray that your example of teaching with confidence and authority builds up your church in love. May all church leaders and teachers honor your instruction and model your inclusive ways. God of grace. Renewing God, we pray for all of creation, that waterways flow clean and clear, natural spaces are protected, and our planet is healed. Let us commit to thoughtful care of the earth, God of grace. Justice-seeking God, we pray for those in government and community leadership, that they lead with honor and mindfulness. May they remember their covenants and be upright in their ways. We pray especially this week for the people of Algeria, Libya, Morocco, Western Sahara, and Tunisia, God of grace. Compassionate God, we pray for all in need, especially those who have known rejection, any who struggle with long-term illness or chronic pain, those without access to safe housing or health care and any who suffer. If you have additional petitions, I invite you to offer them out loud or in your hearts. My brother, God of grace, still speaking God, we pray for our congregation, for its artists and musicians, for its educators and caregivers, that all gifts are used to care for those in need and to live out your example of accompaniment, gospel witness, and love. God of grace. Eternal God, we remember all who have been teachers, mentors, and companions in the church and in our lives. We trust that all who have died rest in your loving care. God of grace. Receive our prayer. Knowing the Holy Spirit intercedes for us, we offer these prayers and the silent prayers of our hearts in the name of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. And may the peace of the Lord be with you always and also with you.
Let us pray. Blessed, Blessed are you, God of all creation. Through your goodness, we have these gifts to share. Accept and use our offerings for your glory and for the service of your kingdom. Blessed be God forever. Amen. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is indeed right, our duty and our joy, that we should at all times and in all places give thanks and praise to you, almighty and merciful God, through our Savior Jesus Christ, who on this day overcame death and the grave, and by his glorious resurrection, Open to us the way of everlasting life. And so with all the choirs of angels, with the church on earth and the hosts of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Holy God, in the beginning, your love shone in the darkness, and at the end, your glory will shine from your perfect city. Along the way, you have filled your people with light and life. A pillar of fire, you led us through the wilderness. A lamp to our feet, your word illumines our path. The dawning of a new day, your rescue ends our morning. In Jesus the Christ, the light of the world, you shine in our hearts, giving food to the hungry, rest to the weary, wisdom to the cynical, and life to the dead. So we give thanks that in the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread, gave thanks, broke it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. And again, after supper, he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people, for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. Celebrating his wisdom and authority, let us proclaim the mystery of our faith. Christ has died. Christ has risen. Christ will come again. In Christ, the dividing wall of hostility has come down and become the table where we gather in peace. So we ask with confidence that you send his spirit on these gifts and those who share them, that our swords would be beaten into plowshares, our spears melted to pruning hooks, strangers recast as friends, and enemies transformed into siblings. As you love us without cause, may we praise you without end, ever living, ever loving, ever transforming God, life and communion now and forever. Amen. And gathered into one by the Holy Spirit, let us pray as Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen.
Let us pray. God of glory, you nourish us in your word, who is bread of what? Fill us with your Holy Spirit, that through us the light of your glory may shine in all the world. We ask this in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Does anyone have any announcements before the blessing? Any notes or anything? Uh, the annual meeting, we'll do that after worship today, we'll meet in the fellowship hall, so you can move over there. Someone asked me, can I attend the annual meeting if I'm not a voting member? The answer is yes, you can. You can also have the bagels too. Those are for non-voting members as well as voting members. Um, we have grief support this week at six. That's open to everybody, grief support at six on Wednesday. And then Wednesday is also Ruth Grund, who might, she's, might be our oldest member of the congregation. She's going to turn, I think it's 94. So happy birthday to Ruth. She's doing well. So good for her. I invite you to receive the blessing. May God, who in Christ Jesus gives us a spring of water welling up to eternal life, perfect in you the image of the Trinity's glory. And may the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be with you now and forever. Amen.
Go in peace, rejoice in Christ's teaching. Thanks be to God. Thank you.